Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering medications that um, are used during pregnancy and medications that are used for infertility. So before I even get started, guys, if you haven't done so already, please do not forget to like and subscribe below. Make sure you press that red notification button so that every time a new video is released, you'll be notified. Now, every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a video is released. Every Sunday, Eastern Standard Time, 1 p.m. However, um, during the week, sometimes I release bonus videos, and the only way you'd uh, be uh, notified is if you press that red button, so be sure to do that. Another thing, guys, please, I can't even describe how many emails I get or on my social media platforms, people who say, thank you so much, you really helped me. If I really helped you, I want you to do one thing for, for me besides liking and subscribing, guys, please share my content. That would be very helpful to me. Don't forget, you can find me on other, other social media platforms such as TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and of course, I have uh, my audio lessons available for you on my website at nexusnursinginstitute.com. So before we get started, guys, as you know, we're going to pray. If you're not into it, that's fine. Go ahead and fast forward. But those that want that prayer, go ahead, close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for our lives. Thank you that we're alive. We're breathing. We're healthy. Jesus Christ. We're not six feet under. Thank you for that. Thank you for our children. Thank you for their health. Thank you for our loved ones that are alive and breathing. Thank you for our support system. Lord, thank you for bringing us this far. Father God, I ask for forgiveness for each and every one of our sins. I know we fall short of your glory every single moment, Father God, but Lord, I ask that you please allow us to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And when we're doing something that is wrong, Father God, let us be sensitive to that Holy Spirit and let us stop, Father God. Lord, I ask that you please help myself and every single viewer, Lord. I ask that you please help me deliver this information in a way that's palatable, that they can understand, Father God. Please help every single viewer that's watching this video, whether they're studying for NCLEX, whether they're still in the nursing program and they have a test coming up. Father God, please, Help them to understand this material. Help them to understand the content. Help them to recognize these principles when they see them on the exam so they can know what the answer is. Help them to understand priority and delegation, just everything that is so important for these nursing exams, Father God. I ask that you please help them each to do better. Help them to do well on their tests. And Father God, I ask, please, when they get that license, Lord, let them be a blessing to others. Thank you for all you've done and all you'll continue doing. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. Which medication category is contraindica contraindicated in clients who are pregnant? One, pregnancy category A, two, category B, three, category C, or four, pregnancy category D? And guys, the correct answer is four. Pregnancy category D. So with pregnancy category D, um, there's a very high risk to the fetus. And when I say high risk to the fetus, that there's a very high chance that, you know, that fetus is going to come out with some type of abnormality. So when a medication is pregnancy category D, we do not give it unless mom's life is in danger. Okay. Now let's look at the other choices. Choice A, pregnancy category A, there's a very, there's a very remote risk. So, um, the harm is very minimal. Okay. Choice a B, there's a slightly higher risk, but these types of meds are given very often to women who are pregnant. Choice C, um, category C, I should say, this is where there's greater risk. So with these medications, they're going to give it very cautiously if the woman's pregnant. Now, um, there's a category that was not on this list that you absolutely need to be aware of, and that is category X, like DMX, right? So category X, under no circumstances are you to give that type of medication to a pregnant woman because that medication will most definitely either cause substantial abnormalities to the fetus or it might even cause a miscarriage, okay? So um, make sure you guys also know uh, category X. Next question. The client who's pregnant is prescribed ferrous sulfate and iron product. Which statement indicates the nurse 
excuse me, indicates to the nurse the client needs more teaching. I should have worn my glasses. One, I should increase my fluid intake and fiber when taking this medication. Two, I will take a daily stool softener to prevent becoming constipated. Three, if I notice that my stool becomes black, black or dark, I will call my obstetrician. Or four, I should take my iron tablet two hours after I eat. And guys, the correct answer is three. If I notice that my stool becomes black or dark, I will call my obstetrician. Now, if you go back to the question, the question asks which one requires further teaching. Whenever you see a question saying what requires further teaching, what requires follow-up, what requires clarification, what they're really asking you is which one's the wrong answer choice. And three absolutely is the wrong answer choice. She's saying if her stool is black or dark, she's going to call her doctor. For what? Iron makes your stool dark, black, tarry. That is an expected side effect of the medication. So you have to teach the patient in advance that taking this medication, it will turn your stools dark. So that's why that's the correct answer. Now let's talk, up, talk about the other choices. One, I should increase my fluid intake and fiber when I'm taking this medication. Absolutely. Why? Iron is very constipating. It will cause constipation. Or it can, I should say, it can cause constipation. So you're going to teach a patient to drink lots of fluids. And when I say fluids, not juice, I'm talking about water and lots of fiber. Um, choice number two, I'll take a daily stool softener to prevent um, becoming constipated. True, there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't require um, further follow-up. Choice four, I should take my iron tablet two hours after I eat. Absolutely, why? Iron should be taken on an empty stomach. On an empty stomach. Something else I want to bring to your attention, don't forget, guys, uh, you're going to teach the patient to drink either orange juice or make sure they have vitamin C because that ascorbic acid is what allows that iron to be absorbed. And that's something that's also very important to teach um, the pregnant woman. The client who's 32 weeks pregnant and in preterm labor is prescribed terbutaline brethine, a beta adrenergic agonist. Which data would warrant intervention by the nurse? One, client's respiratory rate is 34, two, fetus heart rate 150, three, client's apical pulse 104, or four, client reports no contractions. And guys, the correct answer is one. The client's respiratory rate is 34. So let's talk about this. Um, the medication that the patient's getting is breathing, which is a beta adrenergic agonist. What is something that we know about this medication? It causes bronchodilation. So if we're giving this medication to a patient and that patient starts coughing, they start wheezing, they um, have tachypnea. Those are signs and symptoms that you have to report to the physician right away. Now let's look at our other answer choices too. The fetus heart rate is 150. Well, normal fetal heart rate is 110 to 160. So that's within the normal parameters. Choice three, client's heart rate is 104. Well, the normal heart rate is 60 to 100. So 104 is slightly elevated. But when you take that slightly elevated by four heartbeats, right? Or that patient that's experiencing, <coughs> excuse me, like I said, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, tachypnea, wheezing, coughing on this medication, that's going to be your priority. You're going to call the doctor right away. Um, choice number four, the client reports no contractions. Well, that's a good thing. We're giving this medication to prevent contractions. So there's no reason for us to uh, follow up or call the doctor. So that's why, guys, number one is the correct answer. Um, oh, you know, before I move on, let me go back because there was one more thing I didn't tell you about this question. So I mentioned to you, number one, the client's respiratory rate is 34. You guys know what your res normal respirations are, a 12 to 22, some books say 24, so depending on your book. But look at this rate, it's 34. So when I mentioned tachypnea, that's what I'm talking about, that increased respirations for those that are in their first semester of nursing. All right, next question. The nurse is preparing to administer a medication in a labor and delivery unit. Which medication would the nurse question administering? One, the anticonvulsant magnesium sulfate to a client with preeclampsia. 
two, the synthetic prostaglandin, I cannot speak, the synthetic prostaglandin uh, dinoprostone cervidil to a client with asthma. Three, the corticosteroid beta-methasone celestone to a client who's 27 weeks pregnant. Or four, a tocolytic oxytocin pitocin to a client with an incomplete abortion. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is two, the synthetic prostaglandin dinoprostone cervidil to a client with asthma. Why? This medication is contraindicated in patients who have asthma. Why? That med can bring on an asthma attack. So we cannot give that medication to asthmatics. So if the doctor orders that medication and you know your patient's asthmatic, are you just going to blindly give the medication because the doctor ordered it? No, you're going to withhold that medication, call the doctor or the nurse practitioner and say, hey, you know, I know you ordered this medication, but my patient is an asthmatic. And if they tell you to go ahead and give that med anyway, you tell them to do it themselves because you're not losing your license, right? Right. Okay. So now let's go over the wrong answer choices. One, the anti-convulsant magnesium sulfate to a client with preeclampsia. That's a good thing. That doesn't require further follow-up. The patient has preeclampsia, so they're at risk for seizures. So what are we going to give to prevent that patient from having the seizures? The magnesium sulfate. It makes sense. There's nothing wrong with that. Choice three, cortic uh, the corticosteroid beta-methasone to the client that's 27 weeks gestation. Why would we be giving the steroid to the patient that's 27 weeks gestation? To increase the fetal lung maturity. 27 weeks, does that fetus have enough a surfactant yet? Would they be able to survive outside of the wound? No. So we give surfactant to increase the lung mature. We give surfactant. <laughs> we give um, the steroid, the beta-methasone, to increase that uh, lung maturity, to increase that surfactant in the fetus. So there's nothing wrong with that. And remember, guys, it's 27 weeks. So we can give um, that um, beta-methasone, we can give that up to 36 weeks gestation. So nothing wrong with that. And then choice four, the top... Tocolytic oxytocin pitocin to a client with an incomplete abortion. Okay, so, and that's a tongue tire. The tocolytic oxytocin pitocin. What is that? That's a uterine stimulant. It's a uterine stimulant. So it makes sense that we would give a uterine stimulant to someone who had an incomplete abortion because that uterine stimulant was called what? Cause what? Contraction and expel those fragmented pieces of the fetus out. Because if those fragmented pieces of the fetus stays within the patient, guess what? That patient most likely is going to have what? Infection, sepsis, we might be dealing with hemorrhage, all types of other issues. So we have to make sure that all fragments of uh, that fetus has been expelled, okay? So there's nothing wrong with that. And that's why number two is the correct answer because we do not give that prostaglandin to a patient with asthma. Absolutely not. Before I forget, guys, please do not forget I've asked you already, but if you haven't done so, please guys share my content on your social media platform. That will really help my channel to grow and allow me uh, more resources and help me to be more available to make more videos for you. So please don't forget to share my content. All right, moving on guys. The client in labor has an epidural catheter in place for anesthesia. Which intervention is most important for the labor and delivery nurse? One, assist the client with breathing exercises during contractions. Two, ensure the client's legs are correctly positioned in the stirrups. Three, have the significant other scrub for the delivery of the baby. Or four, titrate the epidural medication to ensure analgesic effect. And guys, the correct answer is two. You're going to ensure the client's legs are correctly positioned in the stirrups. And that is going to be your priority. Why? They're getting epidural. They're not going to be able to feel their legs. Okay? And we want to make sure that um, that patient has no neurovascular compromises. So you need to make sure that that patient's legs is safely up on the stirrups 
to prevent damage to the lower extremities. And that's your priority in this situation. Now let's go over the wrong answer choices. One, assist the client with breathing exercises during contractions. Yes, that's wonderful. You want to do that, but it does not take priority over that patient safety and making sure that there's no damage. There's no neurovascular, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not deficiency, not damage. It's going to come to me, but we don't want to put that patient at risk for any neurovascular damage to those lower extremities. So even though that's good with the helping them breathe, those breathing exercises, it doesn't take priority over um, choice number two. Choice three, have the significant other scrub for the delivery of the baby. Again, that is wonderful, but it does not take priority in uh, protecting those lower extremities. And choice four, titrating the epidural medication to ensure an analgesic effect. That's going to be the nurse's anesthesis or the anesthesia. The nurse anesthesis or the anesthesia. Anesthesiologist? Anesthesia. You guys know what I mean. I'm so annoyed. You guys know what I mean. The anesthesiologist. Did I say that right? Anyway, it's going to be one of those two. It's not going to be you, the RN, or the LPN. Next question. Which assessment data would warrant immediate intervention for the client in labor who's receiving an oxytocin pitocin drip, a tocolytic agent? One, the uterus periodically becomes hard and firm. Two, the client complains of an urgency to void. Three, the client denies the urge to push. Or four, the fetal heart rate does not return to baseline. And guys, the correct answer is three. The fetal heart rate does not return to baseline. Uh-oh. So during that contraction, we expect we're going to see that fetal heart rate go down, right? But as relaxation happens, we expect it to go back up to heart, back to baseline. So we see that fetal heart rate not going back to baseline. What does that tell us? Distress, fetal distress. That's a problem. So that's the one that... Um, let me go back to the question to see what they ask. Give me a second. That's the one that's going to warrant immediate intervention. Remember, when it says warrant immediate intervention, follow up, clarify. What they're really asking you is which one is wrong. And in this situation, that's the one that's wrong. We expect the heart rate to go back to baseline. And if it doesn't, that is a symptom of fetal distress. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, the uterus becomes periodically becomes hard and firm. Nothing wrong with that. Why is that a uterus becoming hard and firm? The contraction. What does Pitocin do? It brings on contraction. So we expect that patient to have contractions when we give them Pitocin. So there's nothing wrong with number one. Absolutely nothing. Choice two, the client complains of an urgency to void. Nothing wrong with that. Why are they complaining of an urgency to, vo to void? That's the baby's head, excuse me, fetus. That's the fetus head that's pushing on the bladder. And that's why mom is having that urge to void. So nothing wrong with that. Three, the client denies the urge to push. Nothing wrong with that. That just lets us know that this patient is not in the last stage of labor yet. That's it. But the only thing that's wrong that would require further intervention follow-up would be choice number four, when that fetal heart rate does not return back to baseline. The client who's 38 weeks pregnant and diagnosed with preeclampsia is admitted to the labor and delivery area. The healthcare provider has prescribed intravenous magnesium sulfate and anticonvulsant. Which data indicates the medication is effective? One, the client's deep tendon reflexes are four plus. Two, the client's blood pressure is 148 over 90. Three, the client's deep tendon reflexes are two to three plus. Or four, the client's deep tendon reflexes are zero. And guys, the correct answer is three. The client's deep tendon reflexes are two to three plus. Two to three plus, that's normal. That's what we want to see, okay? So that's... Thumbs up. That's what we want to see. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices, guys. One, the client's deep tendon reflexes are four plus. Guess what? That medication um, is not working and that patient may have a seizure on you at any given moment. 
okay? Go back to the question. It says that the patient's getting magnesium sulfate. Let me tell you something. We give magnesium sulfate to prevent seizures in that patient with preeclampsia. As nursing students, let me tell you what you guys get wrong. Because magnesium sulfate also has an effect of, you know, lowering down the blood pressure because it causes relaxation. You think that we give that magnesium sulfate to bring down the blood pressure. Absolutely not because magnesium sulfate has some serious adverse effects. And there's no reason that we would give magnesium sulfate for hypertension when there are so many other better drugs on the market specifically for hypertension. So we are never going to give magnesium sulfate for hypertension. It has the effect of, yes, bringing down the blood pressure, which is great, but that's not why we're giving it. We're giving it to prevent seizures, okay? There are so many great meds on the market for hypertension. Do not confuse it because I see a lot of students um, get these type of questions wrong. So make sure you guys understand that. All right, my rant's over. Um, choice number two, blood pressure, 140 over 90. Forget that. Remember, guys, we're giving that medication for what? seizures to prevent seizures choice three the client oh i gave you choice three that's the answer and then choice four the client's deep tendon reflex <gasps> zero oh my goodness remember how i told you magnesium sulfate causes a relaxation well guess what if those deep tendon reflexes are zero um it caused a little bit too much relaxation that med is working a little bit too well this patient probably got too much of this medication and let me tell you that can cause that patient to go into respiratory depression so we don't want that we're going to be watching that patient very closely so guys the correct answer is number three which statement best indicates the scientific rationale for administering corticosteroid therapy to a client who's 30 weeks pregnant? One, steroids are administered to decrease uterine contractions and preterm labor. Two, steroids will increase the analgesic effects of opioid narcotics. Three, steroids accelerate lung maturation, resulting in fetal surfactant development. Or four, steroids will prevent the development of maternal antibodies to the fetus's blood. And I know you guys are all going to get this question right because I talked to you about this already. Why do we give those steroids? Three. Steroids accelerate lung maturation, resulting in fetal surfactant development. Remember, guys, um, that surfactant is what keeps the lungs from collapsing so that that fetus can survive outside of the womb so those lungs can expand appropriately. The client's experiencing postpartum hemorrhage and has received an ergo alkalytic methylgonavine methadone. Guys, I can't speak. Which intervention is a priority when it's when administering this medication? One, check the client's hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. Two, monitor the client's peripad counts frequently. Three, assess the client's vital signs every two hours. Or four, determine the client's fundal height. And guys, the correct answer is two. Monitor the client's peripad count. What? Frequently. Often. And guys, that is going to give us the most direct measurement of how much blood that patient's really losing. Okay? Now, let's look at the wrong answer choice. One, check the client's hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. That's great. You do want to do that, but checking the peripad frequently is more of a priority. That is gonna give you more information of how much that patient's losing. Choice number three, assessing the client's uh, vital signs every two hours. That's wonderful. But again, checking the peri peri pads, that most closely is going to let you know how much blood that patient's losing, okay? And choice four, Look at choice four, guys. Determining the client's fundal height. What is that going to tell us about how much patient, how much blood that patient's losing because they're hemorrhaging, right? Now you're going to see uh, determine client's fundal height, and you're like, yeah, we're supposed to do that. Yes, it's true. You should do that. But guys, you have to answer your question within the context of the situation provided to you. So even though they give you a correct answer, if it's not the correct answer for your question, it's wrong. Do not fall into that trap, guys. So guys, uh, number two is the correct answer. Next question. 
The male client experiencing infertility problems tells the clinic nurse that he's taking St. John's wards for his depression, which statement would be the nurse's best response. One, this herb's useful for depression. I hope it will help. Two, did you discuss taking this herb with your psychologist? Three, this herb may cause more infertility problems. Or four, is your significant other taking any herbal medications? And guys, the correct answer is three. This herb may cause more infertility problems. And here's why. It decreases the motility and the viability of the sperm. So this patient, you have to tell them they have to stop taking this medication and they have to see their doctor to get a different medication for the depression. It's not enough to just tell that patient, oh, you need to stop taking that med. So you're going to tell the patient, stop taking that med for their depression. So meanwhile, now they got depression and they're not taking anything. And before you know it, they, does that make any sense? So you're going to explain to them how that herb affects, um, their infertility status and that they will have to switch meds, but they have to consult with their physician, with their psychiatrist or with their doctor. Because remember, psychologists, they don't prescribe medications. Psychiatrists do and so do physicians. So you're gonna have them follow up with their physician. Guys, thank you so much. All of the comments that you guys leave across all of my social media platforms, I appreciate it. Those words of encouragement, you guys are always encouraging me to not stop doing videos for you. So thank you. Thank you. They are like a breath, breath of fresh air for me. All right, next question. The female clients taking, I'm going to try to pronounce this drug, clomiphene clomid. It's an estrogen antagonist. Which statement indicates the client understands the risk of taking this medication? One, the medication may cause my child to have Down syndrome. Two, there are very few risks associated with this medication. Three, I should stagger the times that I take this medication. Or four, the medication may increase my chance of having twins. And guys, the correct answer is four. This medication may increase my chance of having twins. So guys, this is this medication is an ovarian stimulant and it promotes follicle stimulation. So this patient very well might end up having twins or even triplets or more, okay? So you have to tell that patient that in advance. Now let's talk about the wrong answer choices. One, the medication may cause my child to have Down syndrome. That's false, it's not true. Two, there are very few risks associated with taking this medication. We're talking about an estrogen antagonist. That is false. There are risks with taking this medication. They can have multiple fetuses. They can have um, visual disturbances, abnormal bleeding. It can cause pain. There are risks with that medication, and you have to teach that patient that in advance. Choice three, I should stagger the times that I take this medication. No, you have to teach that patient to take that me medication at the same time every single day, okay? The client's experiencing infertility, the client experiencing infertility is prescribed bro Bromoc, okay, you guys see that medication. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce the generic, but I can pronounce uh, the trade, which is a Parladel, okay? So they're getting Parladel. The client calls the clinic nurse and reports that she thinks she may be pregnant. Which intervention should the clinic nurse inter implement first? One, schedule the client for a pelvic sonogram. Two, instruct the client to quit taking the medication. Three, tell the client to make an appointment with the healthcare provider. Or four, encourage the client to confirm with a home pregnancy test. And guys, the correct answer is two. The first thing that they need to do is stop taking that medication. Why? That, medica that medication could cause that patient to have a miscarriage. Okay, so choice one, scheduling a pe pelvic sonogram. That's great, but while they're waiting for that pelvic sonogram, because it might be scheduled the next day, the day after, they're just gonna keep taking that medication that might cause them to have a miscarriage. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't, stop playing. Choice number three, tell the client to make an appointment with the doctor. Yes, they do need to make an appointment, but first they need to stop taking that medication because we don't know when their appointment's gonna be. 
choice for encourage your client to confirm with a home pregnancy test yes you can tell them to confirm with a home pregnancy test and then they can come into the office so we can confirm with our test when we check the hcg but the priority is to top stop taking that medication that can cause the patient to have a miscarriage the client experiencing infertility is receiving pergonol and ovarian stimulant and HCG, which diagnostic test would indicate the medications are effective? One, a serum HCG level, two, serum estrogen level, three, negative urine test, or four, hemoglobin A1C. And guys, I know so many of you were tempted to choose one as your answer. No, you see one, the HCG level, all that tells you is that the patient's been taking the HCG, right? The correct answer is two, the estrogen level. When they take these drugs, you should see that estrogen level go up two to three times their baseline before they even started the medication. And that increases their risk, risk, that increases their chance of getting pregnant. And that's how we know that medication's be effect, been effective. So the correct answer is number two. Um, choice number three, a negative pregnancy test, negative. Um, that actually lets us know this medication is not effective because we want them to get pregnant. We want to increase their chances of pregnancy. Okay. Uh, choice four, burning and increased frequency. Sorry. Choice four, hemoglobin A1C. Stop. If you chose hemoglobin A1C, you just let me and the test writer know that you don't even know what's going on here. Hemoglobin A1C, that's for diabetes. Remember that gives us like a 90 day picture of what that patient's blood sugar has been looking like. Hemoglobin A1C has nothing to do with the pregnancy or infertility. Stop it. The correct answer, guys, is that estrogen level. We expect it, like I said, to shoot up two, three, maybe even four times what their baseline was before they started taking that medication because we want to increase their risk. I keep saying risk. Increase their chance of getting pregnant. All right, guys, we are down to our last question. The female client's been taking infertility medications. Which signs and symptoms would indicate ovarian overstimulation syndrome? One, abdominal bloating and vague GI discomfort. Two, bright red vaginal bleeding with golf ball sized clots. Three, positive fluid wave and lower abdominal wave. Four, burning and increased frequency of urination or urinating, excuse me. And guys, the correct answer is three, a positive fluid wave and lower abdominal wave. So guys, what we'll see is uterine enlargement with lots of fluid in the pleural space. And that patient's at risk for having ruptures of um, ovarian cysts, okay? So three is the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, abdominal bloating and vague GI discomfort. When you see abdominal bloating and vague, that's the key word, vague GI discomfort, what comes to your mind? ovarian cancer and that's why it's so deadly make sure you guys look up ovarian cancer very important choice two bright red vaginal bleeding with golf golf ball sized clots miscarriage that sign of symptom of miscarriage whenever blood is bright red that lets you know that the bleeding is active it's not old blood and what do you think the golf ball sized clots are fetal fragments okay choice four burning or their fetal fragments or um, uh, coagulated blood. Choice four, burning and increased frequency of urinating. What's that? UTI. So guys, the correct answer for this was number three. I cannot believe that we're already down to our last question. Guys, if you found this video to be helpful and you would like more you know, questions on either pregnancy drugs or even infertility drugs, please go ahead, sound off in the comments. Let me know what you'd like to see more of, or you know, if this video sucked, let me know too. Let me know what you'd like to see me do different. I won't be offended. Thank you so much guys for spending this time with me. Please do not forget, please share my video, share it on your social media platform. You never know who's been thinking about going to the nursing program and this would just do the trick. Um, don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website and please, do not forget to like and subscribe.
like and subscribe below and again guys you can find me on tiktok youtube face facebook i can't speak check out my um lessons on my website nexusnursinginstitute.com you guys will see me on the next video